welcome back uh, this morning for this uh, last uh, lecture of our course uh, on Internet and Society Topics. Uh, I'm particularly happy to introduce you to our speaker this morning because uh, she's not an extra trustee, she's not a trustee of the Nexus Center for Internet and Society, which is just upstairs. Um, she happened to be in Torino exactly at the right moment, at least as far as we are concerned. Uh, a friend of mine, which is a professor at the University of Turing, Pepino Coleva, a very well known media study expert, told me that Professor Say was visiting exactly at this time. Therefore, she kindly accepted our invitation to give a lecture within the context of this course. Because the topic of her studies at the University of Washington in Seattle uh, are very much within the scope of the Internet and Society. As you can see from the title, her focus is on ICT, so digital technologies, and development in a broad sense. So she has been looking, if you look at the recent, recent publications, she has been looking at the impact of smartphones, for instance, uh, access to the digital infrastructures, and other topics very much of interest uh, for people like us, uh, and like you, since you picked this course, uh, interested in uh, digital technology in society. Um, she is originally from Ghana, and she has been working uh, uh, in the U.S. for several years now. She, she also got a degree from the University of California uh, at Los Angeles. Uh, and now, as I mentioned, she is uh, in Seattle at the University of Washington. Therefore, uh, uh, I'm particularly pleased to thank you, to thank uh, the site for having cards and space for us. Thank you and welcome to you. Thank you. Well, since uh, the uh, Carlos has done such a good job of introducing me. I am going to skip a few of my early slides where I was going to where I was going to uh, do a little introduction myself. So today um, what we're going to cover hopefully in the next you know 80, 90 minutes um, we'll look briefly at the idea of ICT on the global development agenda. Um, we'll talk a little bit about approaches to development, very uh, high level, and uh, then uh, discuss some trends in this field that's called I ICT for development. And I'll also share briefly some findings from a study we did a year or so ago about um, the access, the impacts of access to information and communication technologies in low and middle income countries. So as I said, I'm going to skip uh, talking about myself, but I grew up on this campus uh, at the University of Ghana. Um, those are my origins, and I am now at the University of Seattle uh, of uh, Washington as a research assistant professor. Briefly, some of the research that I have been involved in um, has to do with the way people use mobile phones in low and middle income countries. And in this case, uh, specifically in Ghana, um, I've also done studies of what we call public access to information and communication technologies, which refers to access to uh, computers and the internet in places like cyber cafes, libraries, uh, telecenters, or community centers. I uh, recently wrapped up a study on access to computers and internet technology in commune post offices and public libraries in Vietnam. And I'm currently working on a project in Namibia that is uh, trying to evaluate the operations and the uses of uh, um, three uh, regional uh, study and resource centers which have been set up by the Millennium Challenge Corporation. <coughs> So first, we're going to look a little bit at ICTs and the global development agenda. Um, so what is ICT? Is anyone here familiar with that terminology? Have like you come across that phrase before? Anyone? Looks like not. So essentially it means information and communication technologies for development. Now, have you come across that uh, phrase? Yeah, I see some people nodding. And um, what context have you come across this? What, what, what do you know about this idea of information and communication technologies for development? Yeah. 
as much. Okay, well, in a nutshell, we're talking about technologies, information and communication technologies. So it could be computers, internet, it could be TV, it could be radio, it could be uh, mobile phones, smartphones, or feature phones. Being used in a very targeted way, so deliberately, to bring about some positive change in the lives of people that we perceive to need some change to happen in their lives. Okay, so this is a natural, and this is going to be the, the substance of what I, I talk about today. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit uh, more. But before we do that, I'm going to show you a, a short video of about 10 minutes, uh, which will give you um, an idea, a sample of what we call an ICT for development project.
when they register, they are given a unique ID number promoted. With this ID number, they can call a toll free number, enter this ID number, and they can access their messages in a local language they prefer. They can use phones that belong to their friends, a neighbor, or any other person in the community to access their messages from mobile menu. Electricity is a challenge in our community, so clients can choose to receive their messages in audio recordings, in local languages, or as SMS.
I will work for her at the end of the month. We are able to save time and use that time to take time that is. By gathering accurate client data and quickly aggregating it in meaningful ways, Motec enables more informed decision making, not only by community level nurses, but also for managers throughout the health system. This is the age where we transmit data, which is efficiently corrected and accurate for managers to make informed decisions at district, regional, and national level. That is what Motec is about. Motec is currently being piloted in one district in the Upper East Region of Ghana. A rigorous social impact assessment will measure the effect of the program on health outcomes. We believe that as Motec continues to empower women, healthcare workers and communities with critical health information, over time it will demonstrate its great potential for improving the health of mothers and babies, not only in Ghana, but all around the world. Anticipated benefits of ICTs, which are connected uh, to development. 
may occur at the macro level, so essentially the national or regional level, or they may occur at the micro level, that is for individual uh, or smaller communities. So we have at the macro level things like being able to participate in global trade. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of developing countries put a lot of stock in trying to improve their ability to connect to the uh, global uh, centers of, of, uh, of the economy. So you'll find that even if a country is very poor, in the capital city, they will have very good communication system because they want to make sure that people from other countries, the international community that wants to trade with them can make those connections. Otherwise, they will write off those countries as places in which they can work. And we all know that it's very important as a national macro terms to be able to participate in the global economy. There's an expectation that we can also improve domestic governance. So by making governments function more efficiently, instead of doing everything with uh, um, pen and paper, we can use electronic systems to improve uh, government processes and access to services. Uh, the private sector also, um, um, in terms of business, can or e-commerce enables them to, to uh, develop, to work more efficiently, to make connections and grow the, the economy. Um, at the macro level, we're looking at things like income generation. There's the expectation that when you have access to information, you have access to the means to communicate, you are able to overcome some of the limitations, say, of distance. So you may not be able to do business with someone who might be a better business partner because they live too far away from you. In, in traditional uh, uh, communities, you find that people usually trade with the closer, the communities that are closer to them, whereas there might be better markets further away. So they're able to uh, um, expand their, their market as well as be more selective in the people that they choose to do business with because now they have the means to reach them and to be reached. Savings in money and time that applies across the board, access to market information, access to government uh, services, improved flow of remittances, which is one of the most important uh, uh, benefits from all the research that we have right now of that access to information is that people in low resource uh, environments are able to connect with their family, friends, connections in higher resource areas and be able to improve the flow of resources from them, usually financial, uh, through um, information technology. So anyone here heard about M-Pesa? So it's a, uh, it's a mobile, ma mobile money uh, platform essentially is developed in East Africa and one of the most successful um, ICT for the uh, um, developments. Um, thousands of people are using that and a huge amount of, of money is flowing by, by people exchanging through text messaging money uh, um, either to pay for services or just uh, remitting family, money to family and friends who need those resources. And it's also political agenda and comments uh, a very important expectation around that, that with the access to the means of communicating, and um, this should empower some of people, some of the more disadvantaged groups such as women, uh, children, uh, any kind of oppressed groups. There's the expectation that they will be able to have their voices heard if they have a means of communicating that is not controlled by the states or by more powerful uh, people in their environments. Now let's look a little bit at the idea of development because we're talking about ICT for development. But what do we mean when we say development? And this is a big class, uh, so I'm going to, we're going to try and see whether this, this will work. Um, I'd like you to just gather together with three or four people around where you're sitting and spend a few minutes talking about what you think development is. Okay, and then we'll have a few of you share with us what we discussed in your group, what your concept of development is. So let's gather together. Um,
and, and start a little discussion amongst yourselves. We'll talk for about, uh, I have 10 minutes here, but I suspect we'll, we'll be running out of time. So let's try and do this in about five minutes. And what do you mean? 
believe are sustainable.
because they didn't want to spend the 20,000 CDs to buy a, a, a phone card. So now they could buy just uh, a minute of airtime. They didn't need the mobile pay phone operators anymore. And so suddenly the businesses were dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. By the time I went back in 2007, a lot of them had disappeared. I have no idea where they were. I don't know whether they, their lives improved enough such that they were able to move on to better things. But I suspect most of them, the business collapsed and they've gone back to their, their state of relative poverty that they were in. So this is how technology can give and it can also take away from it. So it's very, very important to think about the sustainability of the, the, the development we will achieve, not just in terms of environmental protection, but the protection of that, those gains that you make during that time. Okay. Good. So I think that, that, was, that was very useful. Uh, um, I, I'm happy actually to see the ideas that we've come up with, which were not focused only on economic, the economic standpoint. Okay. Not looking at development just as growth, or particularly economic growth. Now I'm going to run through these approaches to development very quickly, um, focusing on just giving you a sense of the, the different uh, uh, ways in which people have thought of uh, development in the past. And these have tended to be associated in one way or another with the way people were expecting information technologies to contribute to that process. So in very broad terms, there have been about there are four different ways in which the development has been viewed over the years. Uh, the first is uh, development as modernization. And so this is where development is seen as uh, economic uh, growth. So these are some of the principles that we were talking about before. And so usually development will be measured in terms of a growth in a country's uh, GDP. And the higher the GDP, more development was uh, um, yeah, expected. Um, the backlash to this idea of development as uh, organization was essentially the dependency uh, theory theorists. And they were arguing that what the uh, development as modernization actually means is development as westernization. Right? Essentially the idea that traditional communities traditional society is not developed and to become developed they need to become more like the West and then they would have achieved development. And what they're trying to argue about is that what this actually created was a state of dependency between the West and the countries that were considered to be more traditional in their, in their um, way of organizing their society. So what happens would be that was that the, the core which was essentially the Western communities, as well as the developed portions of developing countries, right, was essentially taking resources from the developing community, uh, which were essentially agricultural and uh, mineral resources, using them to produce goods and services in the poor, and then selling those things back to the developing countries. Right, so creating this dependency where developing countries could essentially not develop right, because they were dependent on selling their uh, resources to the poor and buying at probably higher uh, uh, rates those, the goods that were produced with those very resources. So for them, for the dependency theorists, development would actually be self-sufficiency situation where developing countries do not depend on the developed uh, world for their own uh, uh, progress. A new uh, um, uh, approach that followed that was development as, as self-determination, a participatory approach to development, mainly because the dependency uh, theory approach didn't really provide solutions. So people were trying to find ways to make uh, uh, more realistic the, the path to development. So this was uh, a development uh, as self-determination um, of the people who proposed development as self-determination were looking for situations where the people that were trying to 
support, to assist the people that you're trying to develop will participate in the process of development. Instead of an outside organization coming in and saying, this is what is wrong with your community and this is what you need to do to solve it. Say, uh, you're drinking a uh, dirty water and so we're going to put a pump in the village for you to, to, to use. They would rather gather the community together, ask them what are your needs, what are your problems, and have them decide what they want most, what their priorities are, and then that is what you would work on providing for them. I don't know if uh, um, some of you have ever heard this story, but there was a situation, for example, where um, uh, an agency tried to help a community put a water pump in the village, right? And the idea was that this would open up, say, women's time, because they were spending a lot of time walking to the, the stream to fetch water, to wash clothes, and so on. So having a pump in the village would be a good thing. That sounds like a good thing, right? Now, can you guess what the problem with this was for the village? But essentially, people were not using the pumps. Can you guess why? Well, for the women, going to the stream to fetch water was essentially the only free time they had to hang out with their friends. That was the only time they got to meet their friends, chat, have some, essentially what we might call me time. When they are at home, they were essentially under the control of, say, the men in, the, in, the, in their families. They had a lot of work to do, so they were always just working, working. They couldn't meet other people. So the only time they could do this was when they were going to the stream and you were taking away that opportunity from them by giving them a pump in the village. Okay, so they didn't use it. Now this is, this is, I mean, who would think that people would prefer that hard work of going to the stream and coming back with a bucket of water on their head to having a stream? But this happened because it did not include the community in the process of deciding what they wanted. We might have come up with a better solution. So participatory, participatory approach is designed to try and uh, overcome some of those uh, limitations. And finally, we have the capabilities approach. And this is also another development because the participatory approach had its downfalls as well. Um, essentially, even though uh, people bought into the idea and accepted that, okay, we need to communities in the process. What was happening in most cases was that they would um, essentially, um, I'd say, pretend to be including the communities in the, in, the, in the process, but they would be guiding them towards a particular end. So the participation was not true participation. They knew the end points they wanted to get to. If they wanted to put a water park in there in the village, and they would sort of lead the conversation to the community such that they would end up saying that yes, this is what we want. So it was felt that this was not a very genuine approach. So the capabilities approach looks at development as empowerment, where people have the opportunity to do whatever it is that they want to do. Right, so they choose, they are empowered, they are given the, 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 the tools, the resources to develop themselves. Okay, now this is kind of a complex and very, a little bit loose um, idea. And so there's still challenges with figuring out how do we actually implement this approach to development. So it's a very, just a very quick look at how uh, people have perceived uh, development. Now, with each of these, you have to think about how can information and communication technologies contribute to the process of bringing about these different uh, types of, of uh, um, development. Now, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, what I was going to have us talk about or discuss here was what kind of uh, development is represented in these ways of uh, describing um, the benefits of ICTs for development. But there's certainly been a strong, strong evidence showing that there's, that there's a link, at least at the macro level, between the state of a country's uh, telecommunications infrastructure or the adoption of uh, uh, telecommunications uh, technology and the uh, economic growth of 
that country. Um, again, looking at time, I'm going to skip this video. You will have the, the slides, and so you can go and, and, and watch this on your own. But this is really some of the developments that are going on in Africa, uh, the digital scene. And the fact that even though we are hearing a lot about the expansion of uh, telecommunications, in particular mobile phones, in Africa, it's still a very long way to go before you can, you might see the kind of uh, um, push, the kind of big push development that we're expecting uh, to happen. Okay. And again, thinking about the fact that technology changes so quickly, we've we've seen how uh, mobile phones were seen as uh, sort of a, a solution to development, but now the conversation is already shifting and talking about broadband. So it's not just mobile phones now. Now it's broadband access that is uh, necessary to make mobile phones and uh, produce the kind of outcomes that we're hoping that they will. So let's look at trends in, in, in ICTV. So this, is, this is kind of uh, uh, one of the more important points that I want to make today. Um, typically, we come across some new technology, computers, fax machines, video, and it's, it's uh, seen as a panacea for the problem of development. Countries, uh, governments, uh, development agencies, commercial entities invest a lot of money, a lot of resources in these technologies to make them accessible to their, their populations, and there are very, very high expectations about what this will achieve. Ultimately, these high expectations are disappointed, and so we end up, you know, uh, in a situation where we are still looking for the solution, still looking for the missing link. Well, in 2002, uh, uh, Kelly Minges and Ray from the ITU said that they had found the missing link. It was mobile communications. This was based on seeing the rapid uh, increase in adoption rates of mobile telephony. You see, uh, uh, if you look at fixed lines. Actually, the uh, diffusion rate is going down. So people were actually stopping using their, their fixed lines, which were already in a pretty poor state anyway in developing countries. But you can see mobile phones just jumping up dramatically over the, the, the 30 years that are shown here. Internet access not so fast, but still uh, moving at a faster pace. So there's, there was this expectation that mobile phones are going to be the solution. And so we have this term M4D, or Mobile Technologies for Development. <coughs> so same thing, finding ways to use mobile technologies to bring about improvements to people's lives. The thing is, this is not new. The idea of mobile phones for development based on using mobile phone technology. Before that, we had ICT for D which is now expanded to include m 4 d but it emerged in the, in the 2000s. Um, we had it as it for d initially, so it was information technologies for development. Uh, people were arguing from a communication standpoint, and so we started talking about ic for d so information and communication for development. And so these were really focused on fixed line uh, telecommunications, on computer uh, technology, on internet technology. There's an expectation that this was finally what was going to change the world. That was not new either. Okay. Before M4D, before ICT4D, there was development communication, which was essentially called DEFCON. And this was focused on media technologies primarily. And if you look at the history of how DEF COM was presented, how ICT for D was presented, how M for D is being presented right now, you will realize that the language is almost the same. Now, development communication emerged in the 1950s, 1960s. So you see how many years have passed the language is still the same, which means that neither of these technologies have done what we expected them to do, and we've just shifted our attention onto the next one. We're still searching for that solution, for how that solution is going to work. And 
at least from our observation, it's not over. We're going to have more and more and more something for these emerging over the next years. Has anybody heard SN for D? And you can you guess what that means? Uh, social networks for development. That's that's a real term. It's there, social networks for development. Yeah. How about D for D? It's something that flies in the air. Drones. Drones for development, yes. That's also a real term. It's out there most, probably in the last year or so. People have started talking about drones for development. Using the same idea, the same language that we have for ICT, for B, for M, for D, for D, for D, for D, for DEF COM. Anyone heard of Brian? And this is a very new one to me. Biotechnology, robotics, information, nanotechnology, and energy for development. So that's where we're going next, right? When will it end? When will it end? And in particular, when will we stick with one solution for long enough to figure out whether it will work or not? Instead of immediately jumping onto the next thing and having to start at the right one. My personal view is that leapfrogging is not always an advantage. Okay, there's a reason why things happen in uh, um, in small steps, right? And there's a reason why the advanced communities have gotten to where they have. And so we shouldn't be so keen to jump over those steps because we think we can do that with technology. We need to find a way to get out of this cycle of jumping from one solution to the other as soon as uh, technology begins to change. Okay, so now I'm going to spend the next maybe 10 10, 15 minutes sharing some results from a, a study we did of uh, access to information and communication technologies in public uh, uh, places. Um, this study was called the Global Impact Study. We were not focused specifically on deliberately using ICTs to, to um, provide or uh, to bring about development benefits. Um, we were doing a research project trying to find out, to get some evidence for what's actually going on in the world. And we wanted to find out whether these public access to ICTs actually have the sort of developmental impact that they expected to have. We were we worked in eight countries, uh, Chile, Brazil, Ghana, Lithuania, Bangladesh, Philippines, Botswana, and South Africa, to try and get a sense of what is happening in all these countries. We looked at different models of access to computers and the internet, specifically libraries, telecenters, or community centers, another way of thinking of them, as well as cyber cafes. So in libraries and telecenters, we might call them more of the deliberate ICT for D uh, um, uh, scenarios, where they're actually trying to provide these services, usually at a free or subsidized rate, to their communities to try and give them a leg up so that they will benefit from the technologies. While cyber cafes are obviously just a commercial uh, entity, so they may not necessarily have ICT for the goals, but they could have ICT for the outcomes, because people are so able to access the technologies. Um, what we found was that the main benefit from these types of institutions was that they uh, supported digital inclusion. They enabled people to participate in the digital uh, society, digital economy. And one of the most important things we found that at those particular types of things, libraries, cyber cafes, uh, uh, telecenters, were the places where a lot of people had their first contact with a computer. So they didn't, they couldn't get a personal computer to work with. Uh, they didn't necessarily have friends who had computers that they could use at their homes. It was at these kind of public uh, spaces, whether they were commercial or whether they were set up by a government agency or a donor uh, funder, were the first place that 50% of our survey respondents had their first contact with computers and 62% had their first contact with the internet. So we know for certain that making a deliberate effort to 
have at least, even if it's shared access, because that's essentially what these types of access are, enables people to get introduced to the technology. That's the first step, right? It gets them familiar with the technology and prepares them to participate in the global uh, information society. Also found that it's, in many cases, the only options people had for access to computers and the internet. Now, this research was done in 2010, 2011. So remember that this is a time when also mobile phone uh, use was expanding. And the expectation is that this means that everybody can get access to, to, to the internet and the, the resources there because they have access to a mobile phone. That was not the case. People still needed to go to cyber cafes or to libraries or to telecenters to get either free or shared access to information technologies. Um, they considered these venues to be important places where they could get information. It's that simple. Now, all this seems very mundane, right? But that's what people said. This is what is important about these venues. Not necessarily that it's changing my life in a huge way. But I can get access to information when I need it, and different types of information. So not just health, not just education, just a broad range of information. It's also tended to be the place where people actually developed their ICT skills. And this we consider to be an important impact of access to information and communication technologies in these types of shared contexts that a lot of people use that time to practice, to develop, to learn about how to use technologies. Now then, what is the impact? Well, that's what people tend to look for. From our, my perspective, what I've just described is impact. But if you go to someone who's trying to fund a project, that is just access. Right? And to, to, to someone who's trying to bring about development uh, goals, Access is not enough. We need to go further. We need to change a person's life. Okay. So we were trying to find out what kind of impact then beyond access does uh, um, ICT um, technology in public places have. Uh, first thing that we looked at was in essence who does this impact, uh, who, is, who is this impact accessible to? So what types of people were using these venues? Because they would be the people who would have the impact. Well, we found out that most of the users were young, they were male, fairly well educated in the sense that most of them, a huge majority, had at least a high school education. And some had a, a university education, some were graduate uh, students. A, a very high percentage of students, as well as a fairly high percentage of employed people and most of them were proficient in English, which we all know uh, is a language you need to be able to understand to, to, to have access to the internet content. Um, we also found that in general, you know, they're, they're pretty well skilled in technology already. Yeah, these were people that had some computer experience. They, they felt that their skills were fairly high and they have access to other types of information and communication technology. So the, the, the nutshell uh, uh, summary of this is that it's essentially kind of a middle class, maybe low middle class, but still the middle class that was benefiting the most from these types of access, right? I call this uh, um, the Matthew <coughs> principle, which is a, a biblical um, a concept um, where one of uh, the disciples said, uh, to those who have, more will be given, and to those who don't have, even the little that they think they have will be taken from them. Okay, so we find out that most of these technologies that are introduced tend to benefit the most the people who already are in a slightly better position in life, the very poor, the poorest of the poor, the most development of their uh, uh, efforts are targeted at are usually left out of that process. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is this development? It's an uh, actual debate, debate. Impacts on what? Okay, so we're looking at what types of things do people do at these venues. And from their own perspective, 
what do they think the impacts have been on their lives. We found overwhelmingly that people consider the most, uh, most people consider positive impacts to have occurred in areas of social, leisure, as well as education categories. Now, the fact that education is there makes sense, right? Can you uh, have a guess why there's a lot of benefits for education? Think about the previous slide, which, which, which uh, was talking about the types of people that use public access. There's a lot of young people. A lot of young people, yes, exactly. A lot of young people, a lot of students. So it makes sense that education will be important. That is probably the redeeming quality of this uh, uh, this chart from the perspective of people that are trying to bring about development. It's very disappointing for them to see that social and leisure categories are where most people see the benefits. What development uh, workers are looking for is uh, positive uh, impacts on language and culture, on health, on income, on uh, um, uh, access to employability. So that's, that's where they think the real value is. So when you hear that people are just playing games, social networking, that's not a good thing. Okay, they're supposed to be doing serious work at these venues. So again, the question is, is this development that uh, continues to be uh, up for debate? We also try to find out how, the extent to which people achieve the goals that they're trying to achieve at these venues. And it's trying to take us a little beyond the, the point of just asking people, how, is there a positive effect in this area or not? So we ask, for example, in the area of, I'll just look at uh, uh, income and uh, use that to illustrate some of the challenges of figuring out what the uh, impact of communication and information technologies are. So we ask, you know, for the people who said they use a, a public access venue for employment and their uh, income uh, purposes, we asked them, did you search for a job? 57% um, of them said they searched for a job. We asked those people who searched for a job, did you find the information you needed to apply for the job? 89%, so almost 90% you know, of them, a huge proportion said, yes, they found the information they, they, they were looking for. Then we asked, did you apply for the job? And again, almost uh, all of them said they did apply for the job. Now, we could have gone on to ask them, did you get the job? We didn't ask that question. Why do you think we didn't ask that question? Any ideas? Well, the why, person, why? The percentage would be very small. I'm sorry? The percentage would be very small, like the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot the, of people the, apply, the, and a uh, few of them get the job. A few of them, yes, absolutely. Because so, if, you, uh, if, you, if you ask those persons in that environment, in the local environment, they're not going to find a job in that local environment. Mm -hmm. It will take time. Uh -huh. Maybe if they apply to online to some other countries, and they, 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 they receive some uh, like, uh, interview offers, or they, they can do it on Skype, and then they can move to that country. It takes time. But uh, the data set you have taken belongs to that lo local place. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will take time for job creation in that local place. Mm -hmm. So yes, they, they use internet, but uh, there might not be job opportunities there. Yeah, exactly. So the points you both raised are really important. The thing is, there's so many factors that could affect whether or not a person gets a job after applying for it that we cannot necessarily say are a result of or attributable to the fact that they use an information and communication technology. And there's no point asking. For example, they apply for the job, yes. Maybe there were other qualified applicants, more qualified, so someone else got the job. Does that mean that the information and communication technology use was a failure? No. So there's, 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 asking that question does not really give us any useful information because it's very difficult for us to be able to make that link. And that's one of the biggest problems with identifying the impacts of information and communication technologies. ICTs are general purpose 
technology. You can use them for anything. And there, there, there are a lot of uh, intervening social factors that de determine what happens after you use the public uh, uh, um, and information and communication technology in any context. Of course, here we will focus specifically on using the public access venues, internet cafes, libraries, and telecenters. So it makes it even more complex. But even if you're just thinking about you know, using a mobile phone and you're saying that there are lots of uh, job platforms right now, and someone you know, gets uh, uh, invited to a job interview by the, using their mobile phone, and they, they get the job. Is it because they use the mobile phone? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you know their uncle knows the, the father or the sister of you know the, the, the manager of the company, and so the person well, you know, was able to make that connection and get the job. We don't know. So it's very difficult to actually say that this is attributable to the use of information and communication technologies. But we can know for certain that it's good for people to be able to communicate, to have access to information, um, trying to determine the specific impact that it has in a specific uh, context is what is the more challenging thing and uh, sometimes leads to us having um, unrealistic expectations of what information and communication technologies can do. Now, the critique that we usually get around the fact that people are doing a lot of playing, playing games, uh, social networking, Skyping, emailing, and so on, online, downloading music, um, has been that is a waste of time. So we also try to investigate a little bit whether it actually is a waste of time. Now, again, a lot of this is based on the perceptions of our, our, our respondents. So we have to take it with a pinch of salt. But at least there was strong evidence that, for example, almost 95% of those who use computers for communications and media purposes said they felt that it had helped to improve their ICT skills. So that act of playing with technology actually has some useful outcomes. If people are supposed to be able to function in the digital uh, world, then they need to be comfortable with technology. And one of the ways that we get comfortable with technology is by playing with it. Rather than consciously trying to work with it, we play around with it and we become very comfortable. And then when we need to do something serious, we're able to do it more comfortably. Now, I want you to look at this, this picture, and this is, this is my last slide, and tell me uh, if you see anything interesting in any of these, uh, um, these uh, uh, visuals. Anything interesting about the technology that is uh, displayed? And this relates to the idea that we Anyone notice anything? No one, is, no one is using the computer. No one is using a computer. Yes. Well, but the uh, computers are there, right? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, yes. In my thinking, the people from different backgrounds or from different areas, from different continents, from, uh, they have come, come came from different contexts, mm -hmm. from different religions. Mm -hmm. they, they are connected to same devices, same technology, so mm -hmm. it has globalized people. Mm -hmm. If is there, I see the commonality in this mm -hmm. thing, right? Like okay. all, all are connected to same thing. Mm -hmm. So it has uh, really put the world into a small, small, uh, like uh, in the world global village. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so representing sort of a globalization of technology. Now I want you to take a look at the individual picture and you see a laptop, and this, let's, let's focus on that one picture there. You see a phone, and you see a book, all together at the same time, right? This is typical of what a lot of us do, right? One technology does not take over completely another one. You still find that all technologies are important. And the reason why I raise this is that I think it's dangerous when we uh, decide that one technology is optimal because a new one has come up and we're going to focus on using the new one to bring about development. We tend to have a blended approach to our use of technologies 
to serve whatever purposes we have for them at any point in time. So we should always recognize the history of different types of technologies from the printed media to the digital media that we, we, we have now. They all still have a role to play in people enhancing whatever uh, uh, livelihoods or resources they have at their disposal. So I'm going to end there. We have about uh, seven minutes. Um, if you have any questions or comments, just give me up. Thanks a lot. to expect 
that there will be these huge uh, uh, levels of use of these technologies for health, for uh, income generation, and so on. Um, we hope that when people need to use the internet, say, to find information about something that might be wrong with them, that they will find that information. But you don't look for information on your health every day, do you? No, but you communicate every day. So naturally, if you ask someone, what do you usually do, or how often do you do A, B, C, and D on the, on the, on the internet? They're going to say, I communicate every day. I check on my health maybe once a month or you know once a year if there's something wrong with me. You know, I look for a job. Hopefully, I'm not looking for a job every day, but right? I mean we, we, we hope that that's not the situation. So if you are if you are unemployed, yes, but if you have a job, you're not going to be looking for a job online. So the balance when you try when you compare communication and leisure activities with some of these other categories, you're really comparing apples and oranges. You shouldn't be comparing them that way. If, for example, you look at young people only, then you might try and make a connection and say, are they using it uh, at high levels for education? That makes sense, right? If you're looking at maybe um, older people in a community where some disease is endemic, then you might be looking at health and seeing whether that particular population is able to use the, the available resource to uh, um, try and resolve some of the health issues. So we have to start looking not at blanket categories across blanket population, but start thinking in more targeted ways so that you can find out whether when somebody needs to use something, they are able to use it. And stop trying to compare things that we naturally as human beings do on a daily basis with things that we are likely to do on a less regular basis. Good question. The uh, are we developing some uh, data security protocols with the development of this new technology? Because in my region, most of the old people, they think that uh, the data which is being gathered by these devices can be used against us in future. That is a really good question. Um, oh, well, it's asking whether there are any uh, security protocols being uh, developed for these uh, um, technologies or services that are, are, are being offered to developing uh, communities. And the fact is that this has not been a priority. Access tends to be the priority right now in a lot of these countries. And they don't, we haven't started thinking about these types of questions, privacy, security of your information. We have a few institutions now that are trying to introduce those concepts so that they are uh, uh, become sort of mainstream in all these developments, but we are a long way from people even understanding what it means when they use a mobile phone and what happens to their, their, their information. We have some services now, for example, where people get um, paid to take surveys online. I don't know if you've heard of um, basically text email, Jana, that's what they're called now. And they work with a global uh, marketing brand. And people in developing countries take surveys on their mobile phones and they get paid with a little airtime. Very uh, attractive uh, composition for them. But what is the, the business model for the person offering these services? They're selling that information that people are providing to the marketing brands so that they know how to target these populations in developing countries. I don't know if when people are answering those services and are getting their air traffic, they understand what is happening with their information. I suspect that they do not. Right? So there's a lot of education that needs to be done so that people understand. So at the very least, if you're going to participate in these processes, you know what you're, you're signing up for, that your information is not, not necessarily not secure, but that it is being used for profits. Uh, or better goals um, by the, the people who are, who are currently offering you something uh, which is actually really pretty small in terms of the airtime. So I think that's, that's, that's definitely an area that is a lot of work in development. If I can make a comment on something, it's very interesting your results about public access to the policy because the, they also apply, I think, uh, in a country like Italy. Uh, in the sense that we look at the data of our statistical institute, we see that we have you know, pretty large digital divide. 
cultural, economic, political, structural, and uh, so there are parts of the country which I think are, are not that far different from uh, the, the scenario that I described, and where public access computers in libraries or other places are extremely helpful. Uh, typically, uh, people say that typically older, single people, uh, typically they don't have time attention, they have no way of accessing the internet, even if it's a big and very useful for them or help with other issues or other issues. And so the, the new reinforcement might be used, uh, not based on data that the public access computers can be very useful to bridge digital divide also in Italy. Absolutely. Even in the US, there are uh, quite a wide range of different kinds of public access venues, particularly uh, libraries, but also uh, community and technology centers, as they call them. And one of the challenges that we face with this idea is the expectation that these places should be, uh, should have high levels of traffic. And so it makes it difficult for you know, a sponsoring agency or government to make the decision to put, to invest in this kind of service, uh, computer or internet service in a place where it's likely that maybe only two people will use it uh, on a daily basis. So what they want is to have 100 people passing through, then they know that yes, they're providing a service. But the people that need the service really need it, but there may be just a few of them, but they need that service. For them, it could be a matter of life and death. So again, we have to start thinking differently about cost-benefit, and how we measure the benefit of something based on more quantity, uh, whereas we should be looking perhaps more at quality of the, the lives for the few people that need the service for, for, for these reasons. There's some um, research, and I, I forget um, how long ago this was done, which uh, suggests that it's even more dangerous uh, to, to, to communities when very few people are poor. Now, if 50% of the population is poor and another 50% is rich, that's not uh, so, it's, it's not good, but if 2% of the population is poor and 98% is rich, you're actually creating a very dangerous uh, social situation. And so we have to make sure that that 2% is getting the resource that they need to elevate them from their, their situation. So if there are no other, yes, one more comment and then we can move. I have a question. And it's raising them as an issue 
that the international community needs to do.